and from the Faculty of Law, I want to start by acknowledging uh, the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land Monash campuses are based. Um, and I'll pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'm coming today from Gurnai, Kurnai, Bonorong, Borderlands. I invite you to acknowledge the people on the land that you're uh, coming in from today in the chat. Um, and I think it's the, the connection between today we're talking about climate change communication and I think the connection to engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their knowledges and understanding of how we can mitigate and respond to the climate crisis is really important. So today I'm really so pleased to be able to introduce Dr Lucy Richardson to you. Uh, Lucy is from the Monash Climate Change Communications Research Hub, um, which an, an, another awesome institute at Monash University, and we're just talking about how good it is to make these connections. So the Climate Change Com Communications Research Hub does social research to build media and policy infrastructure in Australia that adequately addresses climate change. Um, and Lucy um, is talking to us today about um, about climate change communication, the media, the public and messaging. Lucy is a postdoctoral fellow at the Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub. Her current research focuses on understanding Australian climate change audiences and the responses to messaging, understanding how various aspects of climate change are represented by the media. Lucy teaches at the university's Climate Change Communication Unit and is co-editor of the book that came out last year published by Edward, El Edward Elgar, the research handbook on communicating climate change. So essential to us at MSDI, to us as a world. The IPC, IPCC yeah, report just getting. came out, um, just came out earlier this week and showed us that our 1.5 uh, target by 2030 is looking very, very challenging, if not doubtful. There is no time more important to think about the, how we can communicate the climate change message to those out there. Um, I'm just going to ask um, if those of you who are listening can put yourselves on mute, that'd be wonderful. And I hand over to you, Lucy. There will be time for questions afterwards as well, I should say that. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm coming to you from um, Wurundjeri and Bunurong country at the moment. It's where I am at home. So let me share my screen and we'll get some PowerPoint glory going on. Okie dokie. So this is me. So looking at uh, having a bit of a conversation around the media, the public and messaging and how that fits in that climate change communication space. Uh, what I'm going to go through, I will go through each of those uh, sort of topics a bit separately. I'm going to talk a little bit about global coverage of climate change and the Australian attention economy. I'll talk a bit about two examples. We did uh, some studies we did looking at bushfire reporting by the media. And then I'll jump over to a bit of stuff about the public. So understanding our audiences and some of their, um, who they trust basically in terms of sources of information. And then a bit about messaging. So what audience responses might we expect and a presentation of messages. So starting with the media. So the media does cover climate change in a, it's not in a consistent way in terms of constant background noise. It has its peaks and troughs. This was uh, some research done by US um, colleagues in the um, Center for Climate Change Communication over, over there at George Mason and, and Yale. And what they've shown is that there are peaks and troughs depending on what's going on in the political um, and environmental space at the time. So when reports like this latest IPCC report come out, you can get peaks in here where you get a bit more global coverage. Um, you know, when new legislation comes out, um, you, you can get peaks. Uh, you can see this lovely little trough um, in that early 2020 period, and that was when COVID hit and took climate change out of the, the media space for a little while, although it's actually picking back up again and we're starting to see um, climate change coming more and more to the fore in um, recent months. In terms of Australia's attention economy, so where, where do our um, audiences actually put their attention? So this is useful for understanding um, how, how they're being reached, what messages they're reaching. 
um, you probably all realise that the media is not devoid of political um, partisanship, particularly in, in Australia. We, we do have quite partisan media at times and understanding that and where people are getting their information is really important uh, to understand how to reach them, but also what kinds of other messaging they're getting. So you can see um, television is still, commercial television is still one of our biggest uh, sources of news for the Australian public. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, varying newspapers, uh, less so. A lot more, we're seeing a lot more people going online for their news. Um, and this doesn't necessarily, the, the, li the list here doesn't necessarily preclude people subscribing to the online, it's online or, um, or print. So jumping over to a couple of examples of media coverage um, of the bushfires. So we did a case study looking at media coverage of the Black Saturday bushfires from back in 2009, and then their coverage of the Black Summer 2019-2020 um, bushfires. And what this chart here is trying to show is trying to draw out how climate coverage changed uh, in terms of the volume of coverage it was getting, but also the accuracy of that coverage. So if you have a look at those, um, these top two pie charts, um, I don't know if you can, can you see my mouse when I wiggle out over my screen? Yeah. So these top two pie charts here show that back in um, the Black Summer, uh, Black Saturday period, only 5% of articles actually even bothered mentioning climate change. It just was not a feature of the media um, back in 2009. But when you look at the Black Summer uh, bushfires, nearly half of the media articles actually talked about climate change, which is a dramatic shift. Again, partly, you know, this was a much bigger event. Um, and, you know, as we're seeing things get worse and worse uh, in terms of those um, events getting more and more extreme and more and more frequent, we're, we're natu it's natural that people start to talk about this more, but that's, that's a really beneficial thing for us to, to know that the conversation is starting to happen more in that, um, that public space. In terms of the accuracy of science coverage, there was actually less denialist um, coverage of uh, climate change in the more recent ones. So that's, that's also a positive. So back in uh, 2009, there were uh, almost a quarter of the articles, um, about a fifth of the articles actually showed, had denialist um, messaging involved there. Whereas the more recent ones, we've dropped back to 5%. So that's absolutely fantastic to see. It's much more positive in that regard. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually talking about the climate science. So only, so while, you know, 49% actually did mention climate change, the way they mention it and whether or not they're actually accurately covering the science related to climate change is another matter. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so many articles didn't necessarily really cover anything about the actual science um, and how that relates to that, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, uh, if you think about the fact that, you know, with the science being so settled, we should be moving on to talking about policy and solutions, then it makes sense that there would be less coverage of the science because it's, you know, yep, we know it's happening. What are we going to do about it? You would expect to see that shift. Um, however, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's happening. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, about that in a moment. So if you have a look at the, our two biggest media owners, so we have a fairly um, restricted uh, oligopoly, I guess you could say, um, of media in Australia. So the two biggest owners, so Nine Publishing, who used to be known as Fairfax, um, and News Corp, <coughs> excuse me, are our two biggest. And if you have a look at the coverage um, uh, back in 2009, you could see that News Corp had um, over, pre presented over half of the denialist stories were actually by News Corp. Uh, and they actually consistently did that same thing, even though we had only 5% uh, in the second um, study, so the Black Summer area, News Corp again was about half of that. Uh, if you look at Nine Publishing, they didn't necessarily not have denialist um, uh, messaging in there, but it was significantly less and it was consistent across both. Um, what they have increased, though, is Nine Publishing is doing more of the accurate coverage. So again, within those publishing houses, they are, there is diversity. It's not like they only do one or only do the other. They do a bit of a mix of both. Um, and uh, you may be interested to know that, um, the re that our hub, our uh, Climate Change Communication Research Hub, actually has a project uh, running with News Corp 
where we and our partner climate scientists um, produce news articles for the hyperlocal media um, where it talks about climate change and presents climate change information, uh, links it in with the local situation, um, etc. And so we're actually working with News Corp editors to shift the culture from the inside. So we're actually um, found some people inside there that are highly supportive. And so we're hitting mastheads all over Australia um, at that hyperlocal scale to try and socially norm this climate change information so that people expect to see it and expect to have those conversations. Um, and uh, yeah, and hopefully see that shift over time within News Corp itself. So in terms of the way they talk about um, climate change, Within those, those articles, you can see <clears throat> these are some of the, the top narratives. And they did vary by um, news owner. Um, oh, so my apologies, we've used Fairfax here because um, a historical relic, it's supposed to say nine publishing, my apologies. Um, so the triumph of humanity narrative is where, um, you know, they, they talk about how, you know, how we're all pulling together, we'll get through this, you know, we can, we can get by, you know, everybody's coming in to help. They do it after floods, you know, when the community comes in to help with cleanup, etc. cetera. Um, unstoppable power of nature, fairly self-explanatory. It's basically, um, uh, you know, how, how enormous the, 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 the forces are and, you know, you know, we can't really do anything to stop these fires and et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that News Corp actually hammered that one fairly strongly that they were unstoppable. Um, biodiversity loss is a new one. It didn't appear at all in the Black Saturday um, narratives. So that's a new one, which is fantastic to see because it does actually give us a lens to engage a wider realm of the community. So people who might previously have not been engaged simply by the mention of climate change may be really concerned about our biodiversity. And so having these conversations that link the climate change impacts directly with that biodiversity can actually engage a wider spectrum. Similar with the health impacts, because those fires had all that, um, the smoke and um, the far reaching nature of those fires, we saw human um, health impacts coming in as, as a narrative in there as well, which again engages a broader um, perspective, um, no, broader perspectives and connections with the community. One of those chats is boring. Is that a question? No? Um, so failure of planning is basically blaming um, decision makers, policy makers, for, for the events, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, you should have done more to prevent fires, for example, those kinds of narratives, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and human deviance was one, it, it has appeared in the past, particularly in this case, talking about arsonists. Uh, and you can see News Corp was the one who, who really hammered that one more than, um, more than the others. And in this instance, it was, it was actually irrelevant. It was a misdirection, it was, um, taking people's attention away from climate change because, you know, these were caused by arsonists when they actually weren't. Uh, another distraction approach was actually talking about the protests that happened at the time and really talking about them as, you know, out of control protesters and, and really um, uh, attacking the people rather than talking about the issue. Um, and that was another distraction technique that News Corp used in some of their denialist um, articles. <clears throat> We also saw um, connection with Indigenous practices coming through, which was fantastic to see. So we're seeing a bit more connection um, in that space as well, which is um, helpful and, again, potentially engaging and broadening the, the discussions. In terms of who got to speak or who was cited or who was, um, you know, voice was being heard, we actually saw a lot more um, uh, emergency workers, <coughs> excuse me, being cited which is not, not a bad thing necessarily. They are actually quite a trusted source um, of information. We've done um, various surveys. I'm not sure, actually, I think I've got some trust charts later on. I'm not sure if they're, they're ones that include firefighters, but firefighters are one of the top, um, they come out in the top three or four when we talk about trust um, in our surveys, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so politicians, politicians were actually cited a lot. Um, you can, interestingly enough, um, uh, the denialist articles were more likely to cite the Prime Minister, um, as you might expect, which is a bit sad. Um, uh, but anyway, that's, that happens. Actually, actually, it's in my next slide. I'll get to that one in a minute. Um, yeah, and we see medical professionals coming in, which is a new one, uh, and politicians getting um, more coverage than scientists. As I mentioned before, there's a lot less uh, coverage of the science and more political speak. 
So if we compare that, um, so the accurate and denialist kind of coverage, economists were tended to be included in the, the denialist articles. So this is where they were, you know, talking about the expense um, in particular. Um, you know, we can't do these policies that's too expensive or we should have done this because, you know, that would have been more cost effective, et cetera, et cetera. Scientists tended to be more likely to be included in um, the accurate coverage, as you might expect. Um, politicians were included on both sides, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and emergency workers were tended to be included where there was accurate coverage, which is also um, a good thing. <coughs> so jump across to the public. So this was a study done by the Australia Institute, um, I think it was, was it last year? <coughs> oh no, 2019? Yeah, 2020, yeah, it was. Uh, and so they would, they've been tracking how, how the community thinks about climate change and whether or not they accept that it's, it's happening. Um, and you can see it's, it's overwhelming. The community accepts it. It's happening. They know that. Um, there is some <clears throat> divergence when it comes terms to accepting that it's um, caused by human activity, but majority of people do accept that it's happening. <clears throat> Um, audience targeting is one of the approaches that's often used um, in climate change communication. And it's come across from, um, in, through social marketing, from that traditional marketing space where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so social marketing is action for that societal good in comparison to that traditional company profit um, kind of approach. And what they tend to do in these, um, these sort of audience targeting approach is they segment their audiences and they work out which sort of um, subcategories or subgroups can we group our audiences in so that we can have a bit more confidence that people within a particular subgroup would react in a similar way to messaging. And this allows us that, you know, if, if there's a way we can target those particular subgroups, then we can give them messages that are better suited to them and so that we'll be better received by them and acted upon by them. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of these studies is the, the Six Australia study, <clears throat> excuse me, which is a, a replication of something that's been done in the US now for quite a while. And it um, uses a, surveys looking at uh, the community's beliefs and attitudes around climate change. And similar approaches have been used in other countries. So I'll just show you an Australian example. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there was a study um, published in 2018, which compared 2011 and 2016 data for these segments. Um, and they showed that there was a, a reduction in this alarmed segment. So the ones on the left here are those who are most concerned, most worried about climate change. And the ones on the right are those that are less concerned, though this dismissive um, denialist kind of um, mindsets. So the people on the left, back in 2011, there was about 25% were sitting in this alarmed category, um, but that had reduced by 2016. And the authors at the time um, believed that that was actually a kind of an issue fatigue situation where we'd had so many messages about the devastating impacts um, that people had started to switch off, um, that started to disengage as kind of a coping mechanism um, through that um, overuse of those um, disaster frames without, uh, you know, supporting action happening. So that was what they found in 2016, but it's picked up again now. And so we're sitting up at about 25%, which kind of matches what we're seeing in the US nowadays. Uh, in the US, <clears throat> similarly, the alarmed and concerned are sitting up over that 50%. So the alarm segment here, are typically the most engaged um, uh, politically as well as personally around climate change. So they tend to be more informed about the science. They tend to be more politically active. They're um, the ones who are more likely to be doing climate friendly behaviours. The concerned are also worried about climate change, but it's a little bit more of um, integrated in their political identity than it is something that they're really um, passionate about directly. So these people yeah, they're worried about climate change because they see themselves as environmentally friendly and therefore they should be worried about it. So they won't necessarily be as well informed. They may not be doing as many of the um, climate friendly actions as they could be, um, but they are still quite worried. The cautious um, are people on the 
more accepting side of the fence. So they're still a, a bit of a fence sitter, but they're kind of on the accepting side. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so they're not really sure and um, they could be swayed to, um, to take alternatives depending on the situation. Uh, the disengaged, so this group tends to be disengaged across the board. They tend to be disengaged um, in, in a civic sense more generally. They may or may not, might not even watch the news, for example. Often these people are at that lower associated demographic, so they're so busy just trying to live and get food on the table, et cetera, uh, that they, they're just, it's just not a non-issue for them. They've just got to focus on their active living. Um, doubtful are the ones on the, on the dismissive side of the fence. So they don't really think it's happening, but again, they're the ones who could potentially be swayed because they're not, that's not a, um, really fixed in their mind. And the dismissive are sort of the opposite end to the alarmed. They're quite politically engaged. Um, they educate themselves. And so for, for, from the perspective of um, they're very, uh, very au fait, very up to date with the misinformation. Um, so the, 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 the messaging that the, the denialists are putting out and the science that they're citing. So if you had um, someone in that dismissive segment sitting next to someone in the cautious or concerned at a, at a dinner party and they had a conversation about climate change, the dismissive person would probably win because they feel so confident in their knowledge, <clears throat> whereas the others are less so. Um, interestingly enough, I saw a survey recently done by the Climate and Health Alliance um, specifically looking at medical professionals and they actually found that medical professionals, nearly 50% of them sat in the alarmed category. So they're much, much more worried um, about climate change as, as, a, as a group than the, the broader public, uh, which you kind of makes sense considering they're at the front line for, for so many of the impacts that we're seeing. Um, some of the international studies, so it's been done in the US for, for quite a while now, um, and they're seeing sort of somewhat similar results to what we, we have. Um, it's been done in the UK, India, Singapore, and Germany as well. And they're seeing similar sorts of things, um, quite the same sort of spectrum, uh, but with cultural differences. The Indian example is actually quite interesting because it does integrate um, some of the, the caste differences that they see there in, in that particular culture. <clears throat> So further to that, understanding who they trust, so who our audiences trust. This is a study that was done um, with uh, data from, uh, I think it was a 2014 survey done by CSIRO. And we, we've got some more recent stuff, but I'm using this one because it's, it's really interesting in the way they've separated out across the, the different um, subcategories or segments that they used. So they segmented their um, respondents by whether or not they accepted that climate change was happening, whether they believed it was natural or whether they believed it was not happening at all. And you can see the green ones are those that accepted climate change was happening and who they trust is reflective of that. They trust the scientists, they trust the uh, environmental NGOs uh, uh, most highly. If you look at those who don't accept that climate change is happening, they don't trust these ones anywhere near as much. Um, so that, that if you're trying to get messages to these, um, these people, you wouldn't do it through those university scientists. They're not gonna be the most effective voices um, to speak with, with these ones. Friends and family um, pop up the most for those um, dismissive group. Doctors, interestingly, and, and people from their own community. So if you can get their medical professionals to speak up on this topic or community leaders to speak up on this topic, you're more likely to reach some of those people on that end of the spectrum. <clears throat> uh, interestingly enough, there's also research out there that shows that um, if climate change messages come from an unexpected source, so for example, you have a conservative politician talking about taking action on climate change, it is actually uh, have, it has a stronger message because it counters the expected bias that, you, that, that the audiences expect um, and so it's, it's actually uh, has a stronger pull um, in that regard. Another issue that we face, um, which has led to a, a bit of self-silencing potentially, is this concept of pluralistic ignorance. So typically people underestimate um, or overestimate how other people in the community think about the topic. So they don't gauge how other people think very well. So the 2014 study here, which was that same CSIRO study, they actually, um, based on this same question around the causes of climate change, they showed that the actual, and actually 46% accepted that humans were the cause of climate change, 
But when you ask them how many people they thought accept, accepted that, it, they di discounted it to 33% but they overestimated the people who thought it was not happening. So they went from this small, small sliver here to this massive big amount, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So overestimating that denial, um, which can potentially silence people. So if you're you know, having a conversation at a party, um, climate change comes up, you may not speak because you think there's gonna be lots of other people there who don't agree with you and you might not want to have that conversation. So thinking that that way can actually lead to um, some substantial issues in terms of actually having the conversations we need to have. The 2019 study here actually shows improvement, uh, but we're still not there yet. So we still um, underestimate how many people ex um, accept climate science uh, and overestimate the number who don't. So if we jump over to the messaging, so if we look at how people think and feel in response to messaging, um, some of the issues that we face is the filtering. So in order to get your message across to people, they actually have to engage with it. They have to read it or listen to it. And a person's values influence whether or not they'll even listen. So if, if you're, um, what you're talking about is not in, in, a, in a frame that matches their values, then that means that people can just switch off and not even bother opening that, um, opening that uh, you know, news article or opening that uh, post or whatever it might be. And so um, uh, if we think back to um, the earlier slide about um, the framing, message framing, so linking in with those biodiversity um, frames is actually valuable if you're trying to engage people who value biodiversity. So they're the kinds of people who might listen to that message where they might not have listened to a message that was, um, you know, talking about um, the economics of, of, you know, climate change. Um, again, as you might expect, people are more likely to listen if it's coming from a trusted source. So if you're trying to communicate a message, you may not be the best person to actually speak the message. You may be better off getting somebody else to do that for you. So one of the things that our research hub does in our projects is we partner with those trusted sources. So we have projects where um, we provide um, climate information to weather presenters and then they present those as part of their weather program. So weather pre we, we did a study um, actually surveying the public about who they trusted and we asked them about weather presenters and they came up quite highly as highly trusted sources. And because they have such vast audiences through that, those TVs, you know, we, we saw before that television is where, where a lot of people get their news. As a trusted source, they become highly valuable in terms of getting messages across. Uh, and the scientists, which again are another one of those highly trusted sources, the, the news, the News Corp um, project we have has the, the climate scientists are the byline for those. So they are the, um, the, the cited authors for those as those trusted messengers. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned before about that, that um, the theory that the 2016 reduction in alarm was about issue fatigue, if something is seen as too frightening uh, and people don't, don't feel that they can cope with that, they don't feel they can take action, then they can avoid the messaging altogether as a way of coping. Um, and of course, messages have to go through a platform that a user uses. So where do they get their news? Where do they, where do they listen? Um, you know, are they on Facebook or are they all on Twitter? Um, you know, it's, it's no point sending, um, you know, messages specifically targeting an audience if that target audience isn't on that platform. Uh, in terms of message testing, there's a huge amount of research um, out there about message testing. And interestingly enough, the um, IPCC uh, guides for author, the, the messaging guides, they actually have a, a guideline set up to help um, IPCC authors um, in their writing. And it's actually really quite good. It summarises quite a lot of this um, information. So if you are looking for a resource on that, it's, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a good one. Um, so some of the things that have been found through the research is that positive messaging tends to be received by all segments quite well. Um, and we've, if you think about it, there's no one platform that is only going to reach alarmed people or only going to reach um, uh, you know, the, the dismissive people or the cautious. Every, every platform you go to is probably going to have people across that spectrum. So it's very difficult to just target a, a subset or one segment. Um, and so understanding how the different segments respond to a message is actually really important. 
And so some of the research has actually specifically looked at that, trying to gauge um, those differences, in a, a, basically to avoid unintended consequences. Because if you target a message to an alarmed audience, um, you may well put off some of the, the more um, uh, fence-sitting groups um, because of the way those messages go. Uh, that some of the, those um, kind of people in that middle of the spectrum, you know, if you talk about um, a, a policy or, or an action that is going to um, impinge on them um, and the way they live their life um, might cost them money, then that can actually tip them over into that, oh, no, no, it's really not that bad a thing. And so they can actually dismiss it because, um, because of that extra cost um, to them in some way. So positive messaging is, is better received by all the segments. Um, again, local focus is also better received. So people are concerned about what happens in their community to their family, their friends. Um, and keeping in that global connection though, helps us connect in with that, um, the bigger picture, uh, which is quite important in terms of um, addressing it at the global scale. Um, if it's not essential to talk about climate change, then you don't necessarily have to. If you're trying to encourage a behaviour that has a lot of other benefits, um, you may not need to talk about climate change at all. And for the dismissive segments, it's actually quite beneficial not to talk about climate change if there's another way um, that's useful to talk about the, the, the particular um, issue or, or behaviour. Excuse me. Um, and promoting positive self-identity can actually act as a buffer, excuse me, that lets people... Um, respond a little better to the more confronting messages, excuse me. So, for example, um, the Hub has been doing some work with um, some sports persons who want to engage their, um, their sport, uh, the professionals, the amateurs, the fans, um, engage them on the issue of, of climate change. And what they're planning on doing or what, what we've been helping them with is um, looking at, you know, kinds of messaging that they might, that might work, understanding their audience, etc. And promoting this positive identity, so identification with that, that sports group, so AFL, for example, um, and their AFL group can actually buffer that, those audiences if you're having to put in confronting messages. So that's um, a really useful tool if you've got a, a particular identity involved with the sub-audience that you're working with. In terms of behaviour, there are so many things that influence behaviour. Um, but one of the things that I'll, I'll just flag here, if we're talking um, about messaging specifically to change behaviour, um, this is one of the more recent um, theories that have come out, models that's come out, which integrates a whole pile of historical theories um, of behaviour into an actual change process model. Um, and I found it's quite, quite useful. And it's been, it's, they've researched it, um, you know, tested it in, in, particularly in the transport sector for changing transport behaviour uh, and found it quite effective. And what it does is it helps you understand um, where people might be sitting in terms of adopting a new behaviour and the kinds of messages or information that might be most useful to them at that stage. Um, again, in a similar way to the, the segmentation um, in terms of acceptance of climate change, segmentation based on the stage at which someone sits in behaviour can also be difficult. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but yeah, if you want to have a, have a look a bit more at this particular model um, and some of the messaging that's associated with it, I did actually do up a flyer based on the research associated with that. And the link is here. I'll, I'll give the slides through to Becky after this so she can circulate them if anybody wants them. Uh, and you can go and check it out. It's also on the Hub's website. So if you Google um, the Monash Climate Change Communication Research Hub and go to our reports page, it's also on there if you want to have a look. Um, how to best present messages. Um, so there's a lot of, again, research out there on that. Um, but so I'll just cover a few things briefly. So in terms of data visualisation, so a lot of, um, you know, if you're presenting climate science, there's often data involved in that. And we had uh, some of the Global Challenges students do a project for us um, last year where they actually did a whole, a big literature review um, on data visualisation and they came up with a set of guidelines for us which are also published on the Hub website in that same reports area if you want to have a look at them. So they talk about things like accessibility, so colour perception and differentiation. They talk about um, how to, you know, keeping things simple, uh, keeping, using familiar Forms. You know, it might be tempting to use something that's really fancy, but if people aren't used to that format, they can actually find it 
hampers uh, understanding. Um, uh, keeping things clear, it you know, talks about um, even things like captioning um, and it talks a little bit about the type of presentation, so charts versus maps, etc. Um, in terms of images, there's also a lot of research about images and um, that IPCC guide also talks about this a little bit as well and some of the research there. Um, images about the impacts of climate change tend to raise the importance of climate change as an issue, um, but they don't necessarily help people to feel like they can act. In reverse, images around the solutions of climate change can raise people's sense of their ability to act, but don't necessarily raise the importance of climate change as an issue. So it's a tricky thing to balance um, that kind of, that kind of um, images. Uh, it is variable across countries. Um, so uh, it, this is particularly related to some of the risks and, some of, and, and politics. So in some countries, particularly if the, the political leader of that country is quite strong um, on their climate policies, and in those countries, they've, it's been found that the, um, including photos and images of those political leaders can be beneficial. But in Australia, including images of politicians in a conversation about climate change is not helpful. It doesn't raise the importance or ability to, um, uh, to feel feelings of ability to act. Um, and again, potentially ties in with that message, uh, the, the sourcing between you know, trusted voices, that self-identity, you know, if you don't identify with the, the, the images in there, then it's not going to um, have as much effect. And again, local focus for the same kind of thing. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover. Um, so open to questions now. Um, references are in there if anybody wants to look them up later. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you so much. Um, if those of you who are able to, that was really magnificent presentation and some really clear ideas for those who work in climate change research and communication and knowledge to think about how to present that information. I'm wondering if anyone's got any questions. You can either put your questions in chat or we can, um, you can raise your real or virtual hand. Anyone want to have I think I was clapping, but I always have a question. So, um, <laughs> so I, I remember back in 2007 and nine, around that period, that previous peak around climate change leading up to 2011, I guess, um, feeling like I was seeing what you could regard as, um, you know, enemy action, you know, PR, trying to confuse the science, um, denialism and so on. And, and I remember back then thinking that, um, yeah, try and, trying to identify and maybe even call out some of those tactics um, would be a useful thing. I was curious, nowadays, do you still see that going on? And, and to what extent is, is yeah, it sort of well, active spoiling versus something yeah, else? Yeah, that's a really good point. So one of the trends that we're seeing, so I don't know if, you're, if you've come across the, the concept before, but they, there's a, a, an issue called false balance that we were seeing a lot in the media um, over the recent decades where they would, you know, if they're talking about climate science, then they had to have a denialist in the room at the same time um, to cover both, you know, both perspectives. Um, that's actually shifted. So that was a, that was an old, an old approach um, under that kind of the guise of media balance, um, even though misdirected. Uh, but what we see now is most of the time when we have a denialist voice mentioned, it's typically being called out. Um, so instead of instead of actually giving that equal voice, if they are mentioned, it's like um, so and so you know believes this, but that you know the science doesn't support this. So they're actually they are actually actively addressing it if they mention it at all. Um, that that is an increasing trend, and that's and that's in multiple countries. That's not just in Australia. Mm. Thanks. Did that answer it? I think so. Uh, always more to discuss. Yeah. Uh, who who we got next? Staffy, is that next? Yes. Uh, hi, Lucy. Th thank you very much for that. Um, I was just wondering if there is any information as to the influence of a media uh, channel such as uh, Sky News After Dark. Um, uh, there, there was, uh, I don't think it was on the graph that you showed about uh, where people got their, their um, the information from. I know, I know that Sky does have a quite a small audience, but they love saying how influential they are, particularly among politicians. And I'm just wondering if there's any information as to just exactly how inf influential they are. Yeah, people like uh, Alan Jones and uh, Rowan Dean, 
uh, compared to maybe someone who's got a more established uh, platform such as an Andrew Bolt or Rita Penhew, who, who are, you know, all these climate deniers. Um, you know, just what sort of influence Sky News After Dark does have? Yeah, I, I haven't, I, I don't recall seeing any. I, I have a suspicion that we did include it in one of our more recent surveys, um, but I haven't seen the results of that at this stage. So at the moment, I'm not aware of any anything particularly comparing them. Um, especially not for Australia. However, um, we are we are about to do a study looking at the television coverage of the release of this IPCC report that's just come out, and we we are actually looking at Sky coverage in that. Um, so yeah, it will be interesting to see what how how or if they cover it, um, and yeah, what that might look like. But uh, other than that, I'm not aware of it. Sorry, Vicky. Hi, hi Lucy, thank you so much. This has been so fabulous, really, really interesting stuff. Um, I have a question and you may not be able to answer it, but as you were talking through the different types of Australias, I've, I've seen that before, so it was really nice to see what the current stats on that are. And I was just taken by the fact that the alarmed and concerned segment kind of comes to 56% essentially of, the, you know, of Australian people, which is not insignificant, like that's a clear majority. Um, and the dismissive and, you know, and denial, denial type people only kind of make up half that at 22%. And yet we seem really <laughs> stuck politically as if there's almost as if the 22% hold more electoral power than the 56 somehow. So I just wonder if your group has any views on that. And as a result, where our efforts are best placed when we're looking at those six different Australias? Yeah, to be honest, um the hub, I don't believe the hub has research specifically on that political sway side of things. Um, personally, I have a strong suspicion that it's actually the muddy waters. So often when um, elections happen, climate change uh, policies are not necessarily easily identified or they're vilified with misinformation that isn't uh, where corrections are not being um, accepted and, and shared in, you know, as they should be. Um, and so the public, even though they may want to vote on climate change, may not do so. And the 2019, um, there, there was a whole pile of articles come out about that kind of topic back in 2019, um, uh, which talk about this very same issue. The fact that elections, you know, elections can be driven by what happens the week before and nothing to do with people's underlying values. It's, it's a very problematic space. Um, and even though we may have strong political will for change, the way that like the, the particulars of solutions are really problematic in terms of um, how they're covered, how they're discussed. Um, we really don't necessarily have informed conversations and debates around our policies, um, which is problematic. Does that answer the question, Vicky? Tony's next. Yeah, uh, we're after Tony. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Lucy. Terrific presentation. Very much enjoyed it. And I um, was just going to pick up on you made several mentions around health and um, the health professions, and um, uh, the fact that health impacts of climate change became seem to become more prominent in the most uh, severe bushfire season in 2019-20, and also that. Um, uh, doctors and other health professionals are trusted uh, in society in terms of messages. And I was just interested for you to reflect a little bit more on that, um, if you could. Uh, I'm aware that when Barack Obama was in the White House, that uh, whenever he spoke about climate change, he spoke about uh, the health of children mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, um, uh, you know, some of the, the thinking that we're doing around um, uh, by reflecting, by um, bringing these messages to the attention of people, that it helps to make climate change a less abstract concept mm -hmm. because it, it makes it clear that it's urgent because people are already being affected, but it also makes it real for people because there's personal stories rather than just numbers and charts and data. But notably in uh, research and publishing, even in relation to health and climate change, we still tend to go back to the data rather than uh, 
uh, present narratives and stories of the way people are being affected and including positive stories about the way people are responding and uh, uh, the, what we call the co-benefits for health. So there was quite a lot in there, but I just wonder if you might like to say a little bit more about human health in this context. Yeah, I think some of the challenges we face there are that some of the health impacts are they feel a bit more hidden. So when, when it's a health impact like smoke from massive bushfires that floats across massive big cities, that's an easy one to draw on. But things like, um, you know, malnourishment because, you know, if healthy foods are too hard to access, etc. Those kinds of things aren't as easy to identify. And with the Australian population being the way it is and its inequalities and the way we hide or ignore those inequalities, it's again probably not going to be something that currently is on the radar for for coverage, um, and so that would take some fairly active effort um, to actually raise that to to um, the profile of of being important. The the Climate and Health Alliance are doing a lot in this space. They've been doing um, you know policy papers. They've been doing quite a lot of work to to get this you know recognised these health impacts. Um, so yeah, watch this space because I think they're going to be doing great things over the next so many years. Um, and it's definitely something we need to see more of because everybody worries about health. Everybody worries about the health of themselves, their families, their communities. So, yeah, it's definitely a valuable one. Uh, Celine was next, I believe. Thanks, Lucy. I also really, really enjoyed that presentation. I was very intrigued um, and actually quite excited about that finding um, about the attribution of the bushfires, uh, attribution to climate change um, causes and how that so significantly shifted between, I mean, what was it, five, six, seven years. Um, and uh, you may not be able to answer this from your data, but I'm just curious if you've got any hunches on why that is, whether there's been changes, you know, among journalists, like have the norms changed, the practices, or is it a reflection of the public? Yeah, I, I think it's a bit of, a bit of both. Um, I think it's a bit of cause and effect. Um, one of the things that we have seen um, dramatic shift in the denialist techniques that are being used now, I think they've got to the point where nobody can really deny that the climate's changing. I think they realise they've lost that battle. And what we're seeing now more of is actually um, distraction and attacking the solutions. So rather than, um, you know, uh, saying, you know, still trying to hammer that, oh, climate change isn't happening, we tend to see, oh, no, no, it's too expensive to do that. We can't do that. And so the, the, the shift and the, in terms of the tactics is what we're seeing now. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the biggest shift we're seeing, um, particularly in the media um, in that space. Does that answer that question, Celine? Sorry? Yes, very interesting. Yep, thank you. Um, I think uh, Margot's chat question. Uh, let me try and find that. So actually... Um... Margot and Rachel have got similar kinds of questions and it's really about um, both, their, both, both work at Climate Works Australia and both um, have got questions about working with the climate change communication hub and collaboration. And that's a key part of, mm -hmm. of, I think, hopefully an outcome from today. So Margot had asked, I don't know how the hub functions, can we work together on specific topics such as building retrofix or uptake on electric vehicles to inform our communication and engagement strategies? And, and Rachel also had her hand up, was wondering about, she's wondering what you mean by testing different climate messages and how that aligns with other specific sectors. And she was saying she works in the climate transport nexus and how do we unpack messaging on climate for different sectors? So yeah, for example, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, yeah, we, we definitely work in that sort of space. So one of the, one of the studies we did a little while ago was actually message testing around renewables. And so we, we ran um, an online survey where we gave uh, a, a range of different messages and we asked people to rate um, after they read that message, how did it make them feel? You know, what was their response? Did they, you know, and, and so we tested things like, um, uh, one of the findings we had, for example, is that renewables are, are across the board accepted by everyone. Nobody argues that re renewables are important, valuable. Um, pretty much everybody said that, you know, it's a given. It, it's, it's um, what, what was the phrasing? Um, inevitable um, that we'll be shifting to renewables, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So we found some fantastic responses there. What we did find, though, is you should not ever really connect renewables and fossil fuels in the same message. 
because that mention of fossil fuels triggers the political bomb. And that's what makes people polarise. If you're talking about renewables and how great they are and what we should be doing and, hey, we can be exporting this and, you know, all that sort of stuff, everybody's woohoo. That, but in, including any kind of comparison with fossil fuels, dead. That's when you hit, not everybody, but anybody who's, who's on that more denying end or even potentially some in the middle, um, yeah, it puts them right off. So they're, they're the kinds of studies that we have done and we, and we're, we can do. Um, and, yeah, I'm sure we'd love to work with you. So, yeah, definitely get in touch with me. I'm happy, happy to have a chat about what we can do there. Ian's next. Ian. I guess uh, thanks very much, Lucy. Fantastic presentation and just wish I'd had a lot of this stuff in previous roles I've had. But um, I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts on the nuance of how to break through that false equivalency question. I know you've touched on it, but I wouldn't mind just, and it might be one to take offline and, and pick up another time, but with climate change having been elevated to a central part of the, uh, the culture wars in Australia, there's, you've got climate science belief, strong response, progressive politics on one side and the opposites on the other. And the centre, the journalists in the centre in particular who form a lot of public opinion, do go for that equivalency, not just on science versus non-science, but also strong response versus big response, to the point where even a great journalist like Lee Sales during the Black Summer bushfires tweeted that she felt that both sides of the debate were just as bad as each other. <laughs> which is... Which is probably view, right, but... Yeah. Some, some of the mudslinging was, but but in terms of factual basis, it was a, yeah. an incorrect proposition. And I wonder whether anything you've looked at points to ways to enter into that conversation. And it may be way too long a topic for now, but there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure that there is a, a great solution. Um, one, one of the things that the, the hub tries to do is actually... We, we adopt this philosophy of non-persuasive communication. So basically, um, you know, when I was showing that slide about behaviour and behaviour messaging, it's about providing the information that people need to make the decisions without going in with a particular outcome in mind. So we, we don't mind which of the behaviours they do necessarily. Um, it's more a case of providing them with the information so that they can work out what fits their particular situation and context. So in terms of, you know, getting the information into the media, um, you know, some of we, we've done, you know, we, we did a report a little while ago on um, the urban heat island effect and, and what that means, what climate change means for that um, moving forward. And when the media, all the media stuff came out on that, you know, we were there just presenting the science. That's all we were there for. We weren't there to talk about what the solutions were, etc. cetera. Um, so if anybody wanted to have those, you know, policy discussions, that's, that's something else. I mean, we could talk about some of the solutions that can help but it's not about dictating. And so some of the things that we can be doing is when we are voices out there in the media is actually trying to, you know, to tamp down on that and, and really provide that, uh, that evidence base rather than a decision, if that makes sense. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one uh, and there's, yeah, it's a difficult one. Anna's next. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm wanting to point out a couple of bits of research that probably you're aware of, but maybe some of the audience isn't, and also then ask a question. So along with the Six Nations work, there's also the work by Rebecca Huntley on climate compass. And as I said, I'm sure you're aware of it, but, and that's particularly like, it's sort of a evolution on from that six nations concept but quite similar in that it does market segmentation but it also then looks to try and make sure that new research coming along uses um, the similar segmentation so that you can really build up more complex pictures about you know what motivates people how they're thinking and things like that um, and the other, one of the things that is being hopefully bolted onto that is some uh, research around what messaging supports climate policies amongst the sort of soft conservative um, audience. And so that would be very interesting within, um, you know, marginal electorates in particular. And then my question is, um, have you looked at, you know, how the kind of 
climate action is a cost sorts of messaging, how that's evolving, because I think you're right, there's little denialism going on, but there's lots of either it's all too expensive or technology will sort it out. We just need to wait for the technology to develop. And I just, yeah, was interested how much work you've yeah. done around that. Yeah, techno salvation is, a, is, is an issue. Um, yeah, that's definitely an issue. Um, but the, the, the timelines we're facing now are starting to, to really tear that one apart. And, you know, we can't wait for technology. And a lot of the technology we need is actually here now. We're just not doing it. Um, <clears throat> In terms of um, the other part of your question, uh, what was that about? about um, oh, I've lost it. Um, cost messaging. Ah, uh, cost messaging. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. So some of the shift we're seeing there is actually um, raising the cost of not doing. So or the future cost. So if we if we um, if we take this behaviour now. We can, re, you know, we can reduce for, you know, future costs of whatever, you know, or if we don't do this now, you know, it's going to cost our whatever sector this much money. Um, if, if, you know, if money is what people are interested in, if cost is what they're interested in, then the cost of not doing and the co that that future cost is actually um, a, a frame that can be quite helpful. Um, people people don't like to lose. Um, they don't like to lose what they've got, and so if we can talk about the implications of that loss rather than focusing on um, something we have to give up, um, that's helpful. Uh, and also using frames that go beyond the individual, um, using messaging that talks about um, collective good and collective outcomes is actually much more effective. If you focus on the individual, you can actually trigger um, you, you trigger a different kind of psychological pathway in people's thinking, um, and they focus on different details in messages if it's if it's um, very individually focused. Um, economics is the same thing. If you if you start to talk about economics, you often flick people into a, an individual frame, and they start to think about um, themselves, and it, it's, it, it ends up with a quite quite a different um, outcome than you might expect. Um, so cost cost messaging, it's a tricky one, but that yeah, that there has been a shift in that. Sure, you're joining with me in thanking Dr. Lucy Richardson for that presentation. Um, thank you for your generosity with your time in presenting to us. And thank you to everyone who's been here today and for most under lockdown conditions. Really great turnout, amazing chat in discussion in the chat and live. Um, I hope this blossoms into more collaborations. I think we've got such strength in these areas across Monash and we can only learn from each other and, and do better because of that. But thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you everyone. Nice, welcome. Today. Nice to meet you all.